Okay, are we? Take it away. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We are so lucky today to be joined by Helen and Christina, and we're not going to waste any time because this is a robust, robust topic. So go ahead and take it away, friends. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. It is really a delight for us to join you here today. And we're going to, you know, we have some content in these slides, but we really mostly want to leave it open because we, we know that you have lots of questions and thoughts and, and we want to make sure we get to all of them. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce myself and then I'll let Christina uh, introduce herself as well. Uh, my name's Helen Duplessis. I'm a pediatrician and a physician principal at Health Management Associates. I've um, been with the organization just about two years, but I have a long history of um, doing a, a, a number of other sort of medical leadership things over my life. I, I started working in the LA County Department of Health Services, and that's where I got involved in perinatal substance use more years ago than I want to admit to you but have done a number of things since then, including um, I was the first permanent chief medical officer at uh, LA Care, which is our big public Medicaid managed care plan in, in Los Angeles County. Um, I also spent some time in academia doing a lot of maternal and child health program development and policy development and performance improvement work. Um, and in the FQHC world, before I came to HMA, where I also started a medication-assisted treatment expansion project, I've been uh, directing the Mother and Baby Substance Exposure Initiative, which is a state opioid response grant like you all have at HMA um, since we, we got that grant uh, about a year and a half ago. Christina? Good morning, everybody. First of all, thank you to Bridge uh, for inviting Helen and I today. We're very excited to be here and, and really excited uh, to even uh, have the opportunity to network with you guys. You have been a stellar partner and, um, and all the work you do, we wanna recognize all of you at the entire Bridge team for doing that. My background is um, an RN, got my MBA a few years ago and uh, mostly in operations and planning up in San Francisco at CPMC and now I'm down at the university uh, on the peninsula. And I am the clinical lead on the collaborative uh, for the hospitals out of the initiative and have worked with our mentors and our incredible partner, uh, Helen and Charles at HMA, uh, to go ahead and try hard to improve the care uh, for birthing persons and newborns in the state of California who are affected by OUD and SUD. So thank you very much for having us today. We really appreciate it. And that's actually why we're so excited to talk with you today, because we recognize that while the ideal flow of a woman who has opioid use disorder or other substance use disorder might be to have her screened and referred by her prenatal care provider, we also recognize that in many, many instances, frankly, in most cases right now in California, um, these women come to the attention of the medical community often for the first time at the time they hit the hospital, um, whether that's for a complication of their pregnancy and they see you in the emergency department or uh, they're coming in for delivery. So you become just a, a really key piece in all of this. And so we wanted, this is our agenda for today. We're, we're gonna start out with a case study and then we're gonna give you a little overview of this initiative, the State Opioid Response Grant we're talking about. And then we just wanna have lots of opportunity to respond to your questions and comments. We have a couple of little um, opportunities for you to tell us what you need, but we mostly wanna hear from you and be able to give you the, the benefit of any of the good work that's been done by our team and any of the um, background or expertise that we may have to share as well. So we'll, we're, we'll start out with a, a st case study that we got from you all. Um, shall we have the son 
in question read this out or shall I read it? What's the best approach, Christian? Uh, I think Wendy is our yes. uh, son. So yeah, Wendy, take it away. Hi guys, good morning everyone. Um, so um, a patient um, had moved um, from Vegas to California. Um, she was highly mot motivated to seek treatment. She had three kids that uh, were already in um, custody of family members um, that had been removed from the home. Um, she came uh, when she was uh, in withdrawal. Uh, we were able to get her into treatment, get her monitored. Um, we were also able to, she was staying with her dad, but um, she felt like she needed a more structured environment. So we were um, luckily um, enough to, lucky enough to get her into uh, residential living for uh, pregnant women. Um, and they brought her to all her appointments. Um, see, the CPS in um, the state that she came from, in Nevada, from Nevada, um, they did um, contact me um, to, to learn about our program and what exactly it was she was going to be doing because they were preparing because, uh, to eventually, if, if, if she continued on the program, to send the children to other family members here in California and eventually hopefully get the family reunited um, as long as she stuck to program during throughout her pregnancy when she came to us she was about 12 weeks pregnant so um, pretty early in the pregnancy um, she did have some other health elements going on as well um, so uh, she did everything that was asked of her um, from either myself the physicians and also um, the women's home that she was living in. Um, so everything went through um, as planned. During that time, dad came out and he also started on program. And um, they, uh, everything went well, her pregnancy went well, uh, she delivered. Um, there was, baby was fine, mom was fine, CPS um, did come out. And um, the social worker, I and CPS were there. Um, they reviewed her chart, spoke with myself and the social worker, um, and uh, they let baby go home with mom. And about, I wanna say three um, to four weeks um, after, she was reunited with her other children um she was able to have visits with them and then i want to say about three months after that they allowed her um when she um got a big enough apartment um now all, all the whole family is reunited together dad and the children and um their new little baby uh, sister so it was um this is not the norm obviously um there usually is a lot more um trying to, to get moms to stay in program um, is sometimes proves to be a little bit difficult, but um, it's important to share our successes. And I thought this was a really good one um, to share. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, it's really obvious she had tremendous support. She had tremendous strength to stay on that recovery journey, but tremendous support, not only from her family, but obviously from you, which, which really made this work. And it's so awesome because they gave me pictures. Um, baby had gotten sick like a couple months after birth. Mom brought her in and uh, she wanted, she had been in, in, uh, in the emergency room probably for like about 12 hours and I'd come into work and she called to see if I was here. She's like, I want to go out and have a cigarette. You're the only one I trust to watch the baby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so I'm like, of course I'll be right over. And so I went and, uh, you know, watched the baby for her while she went out for a minute to catch a break. And uh, yeah, so. And you know what, um, Wendy, I, I can hear the joy in your voice. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You can hear the experience of making a difference in a person's life in thank your you. voice. Thank you so much. Jill, and Jill just commented, uh, these are key. I mean, these are the things folks need 
to hear. And, you know, we try and share them in the collaborative. Um, they look at that great. <laughs> so, um, Thank you. so keep doing it. But, but that woman's success was due in large part to you. Thank you. Absolutely. I hope you know that. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Great. So we're going to, so keep this case in mind. We have another we may share with you. Um, but I, I want to take you through a little exercise that will help us um, kind of figure out where to where to drive some of our conversation with you. If you all have done this before, I apologize for the instruction, but we often use something called Chatterfall, where um, we're going to give you a prompt, a question in just a second. And what we'd like you to do is take uh, 30 seconds or so, not a full minute probably, and type your response in the group chat, send it to everyone, but don't push enter because what we want to be able to do is see all of your chats come through at the same time. So we'll tell you when to push enter. So here's your question, your prompt. What do you need to know about, peri oops, about perinatal substance use disorder, opioid use disorder to do your job most effectively? So I want you to take about 30 seconds, type in that chat box. Don't push yet, don't push send yet, but take a few seconds and type in that chat box, what do you need to know about perinatal opioid use disorder and substance use disorder to do your job most effectively? Hold on, don't push. And if you don't know where the chat box is, if you float your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, a toolbox, a toolkit, a tool, uh, role will appear and one of those says chat. You can click on that. We'll give it just a few more seconds. All right, go ahead and, and push send. Let's see what we're seeing. All right. We need to know about educating staff we need to know the effects of suboxone on pregnant women we need to know how to educate clinic staff feel more confident in your information um, can pregnant women start view after not using for a month can they gain access to the mom before cps how do you gain access before cps gets involved important what are the long-term effects important um, how long have they been using opioids? Okay, what's her drug of choice? Matt intervention, safe for the fetus. Evidence-based treatment for neonatal abstinence syndrome, good. What dosages are safe? Stronger advocacy, more about baby withdrawal, when, and about CPS. So, so we're hearing a few things. We're hearing CPS is a big one, a little bit about neonatal abstinence syndrome, a lot about bup, mono, and, uh, and combo drugs and their effect, uh, their uh, uh, appropriateness for mom and effects on baby, um, and then education just in general. All right, thank you so much for that. That's really, that's really very helpful. Um, and then uh, I think, I think Christian kind of pulled this together from Wendy's case study. Is there anything else that we want to make sure that we point out about this? Christian, this is just a synopsis, right? Yeah, just, yeah, this is just basically, you know, when you present uh, your case and whatnot, that's kind of, yeah, quick synopsis. Good. Can, I, can I ask a question? Sure can. I, I'm wondering, I mean, this is really a, a stellar example of um, the Bridge Sun intervening on behalf of, of this client. How many of you would feel comfortable doing this, getting this involved with your level of expertise to go ahead currently and be on a phone call with CPS and, uh, oh great, okay. I would have named love this. Stigma, yeah, okay. I would 100%. Wow, look at this, Helen. I love it. Yes, yes, that's incredible, you guys. Most hey. of you, All right. Definitely there. Woo! <laughs> that's fabulous. Here's, uh, 
I, I love it. All right. I'm loving it. Good for that. All right. We need we need to clone you all. We don't have yes. funds. You 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 need to know, by the way, um, because we're wow. such big promoters of bridge, as well as frankly many of the other state opioid response programs that are going on in the state. But we're so such big promoters of bridge. We actually talk often about the notion of you know creating a substance use navigator type role, not just in the emergency department, but in many other areas of the broader treatment and recovery ecosystem, you know, that, that our clients have to navigate. Um, we're, we're going into here to make a compelling case for why we want to have you involved with pregnant substance using moms. And Christina, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. So, you know, I mean, we want to get, obviously we want to get folks who are pregnant into care, right? It gives a better chance to their infant. It get you know the earlier they get in, it gives us more time to plan not only for the pregnancy but for the care afterwards, and that's the key is the care afterwards. So I want you guys to look at that. Uh, and when most substance use deaths occur, they occur after pregnancy, after you have the baby. And when does most support for new parents drop off after? after pregnancy. Helen, can you go to this next slide? Sure can. It's very daunting and I want to let you guys know, you know, the state, the Department of Public Health and, and CMQCC is involved with this, um, runs the California Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review. And I'm going to let you guys read this, especially that identified statement in red. But again, this is the key to getting women into treatment is so that we have them hopefully maintain the treatment post delivery. Um, look at this. I'm, I'm loving these. The chat. I can't yeah. Right. Right. This, right. So, um, so this was, and I want you to look at the two QI comments because I put those in the slide because those are key. Better screening, improved systems of referral. That came out of a state report in relation to maternal mortality. And uh, they wanted to make sure, the state wanted to make sure they got the point across that there is room for improvement and that we actively can work uh, to improve, you know, the outcomes for both uh, the new parents and the moms. So again, just the bottom line, the key to after pregnancy care and keeping them in treatment and connected. And, um, so that, that's the point we wanted to get across with, with these couple slides. Helen, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's, that's exactly right. We, we, we need to have you engaged with the population of pregnant and parenting women, and we need you to convince the docs and the other uh, ex waiver providers or the providers who are in the ED as part of Bridge that it's okay. In fact, it's vital for them to start pregnant women on MAT. It is life-saving for two individuals. It's life-saving for the mom as well as the baby. So we're gonna move into just a, a little bit of a project overview. And um, maybe I'll, I'll start out, Christina. Yeah. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen this wonderful graphic before, um, you've been a little bit exposed to this mother and baby substance exposure initiative, but this is kind of our initiative on a page. And it's intended really to sort of demonstrate our approach that is um, longitudinal and comprehensive and a continuum of care with, as we mentioned earlier, you know, ideally we'd like that path to start with early identification and initiation of, of MAT during the prenatal period, as was the case with Wendy's uh, client. We know that doesn't always happen, so we, we know we've got to focus on the, what's going on in the hospital too. So if they do get connected before the hospital, we want to make sure that there's communication and that there's a warm handoff so that the delivery team knows to continue that mom on mat if she's already been on mat knows that they have to make have some other considerations about pain management because 
whatever she's on, her methadone or her bup, is not sufficient for pain management. A lot of people have that uh, preconceived notion. And we also want there to be very progressive and evidence-based approaches, not only to caring for the mom, but to caring for those infants who may indeed have neonatal absence syndrome. And we'll talk about that a, a little bit more later. And then obviously having a warm handoff on the backhand as well with what we call a plan of safe care uh, that covers the needs, the comprehensive needs of both mom and baby. So mom gets plugged back into her OBGYN care so that she can get family planning. She gets plugged back into primary care. She gets plugged back into uh, her treatment program or initiated into a treatment program if she wasn't before um, at an appropriate level of care. And the baby gets babies developmental behavioral health related needs met as well. Um, we, we also have developed as part of the initiative this flyer, which by the way, we now have in English and Spanish. Um, this was not really intended to be patient facing. It was really intended for um, service workers who work with this population but we had a request to, to get it translated into Spanish, so it's available now in English and Spanish. And the big, the big issue here is what are our key principles in working with pregnant and parenting women and their affected infants and family members? And so again, it's driving, you got a screen, you got a screen using an evidence-based tool so you can identify moms who are at risk for OUD and, and SUD. We got to make sure that the gold standard of treatment, medication-assisted treatment, is made available to pregnant women and that they get started on that. Um, we advocate as much as possible non-pharmacologic approaches to the treatment of neonatal abstinence syndrome, and also really working hard to keep the, the mom and the baby together. Um, Christina, do you want to talk a little bit about this slide and I can add to it? Um, so this is the overview, um, and uh, the grant is specific to our population. Uh, obviously, the increase to MAT, we're going to get into that in a little bit, <clears throat> and letting you know how it is the gold standard, getting folks on view um, or uh, um, methadone is the gold standard uh, for treatment in this population, reducing unmet treatment needs, reducing the severity of neonatal abstinence syndrome, when you reduce the severity, babies stay in the hospital a shorter length of time. That means something to not only payers, hospitals, government, that's a big deal. So if we can bring down the severity of neonatal absence syndrome, and we'll talk about that a touch um, in a bit, that is a big deal. Reduce unnecessary, <laughs> they are a Eric, I got you on my list. I want to hear your story. Yeah. Reduce uh, unnecessary involvement of child protective services, obviously, uh, and reduce um, overdose related deaths. So um, I'm going to have Helen. I want her to talk about a couple of the community events where, and I attended a couple of them in person. I was fortunate to attend a couple of them in, in person. So, um, and, and then the technical assistance. The technical assistance offered by HMA has been really. Um, stellar for these hospitals because yeah. a lot of them really need very, what I'm going to call nitty gritty, like very concrete help, um, whether it's networking, whether it's reaching the right, uh, you know, where do I find those forms, where do I get this, the technical assistance has been really stellar um, and that, that has been open to anybody in the collaborative. So. So, and I, I think, Christina, let's, um, let's kind of limit the conversation about this so we can get more to yeah. some of their, their questions. But yeah. suffice it to say, we've been working with, in 12 counties throughout the state of California. Um, a host of patient-facing materials have been developed that you all are going to want to take a look at on our website. We'll kind of touch on that a little bit later because I think that may be helpful for you. Um, we have a wonderful partnership with the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative and the California Perinatal Quality Co Care Collaborative, where uh, Christina and her, uh, her colleagues hail from. And, um, and they've been very engaged in 
a hospital-facing QI collaborative, as well as uh, putting together just a really dynamite toolkit that the uh, HMA has been involved in um, pulling, pulling together for them to um, should we move on, Christina, or do you want to say a little yeah. bit about that? No, no. There is a question that came in, and I want to make sure we, we answer that one, too. Is, is the grant open right, right. now? Uh, good question. So the, the Mom and Baby Substance Exposure Grant period ends in September, September 30th of this year. We've been at it for uh, almost a year and a half now, working with these counties. Um, we have requested a no-cost extension, but we don't know about that yet. Uh, basically, the state has told us if the feds give them the no-cost extension, they'll give it to us, in which case we'll continue on into probably the first quarter of, uh, of 2021. Um, we do, however, have several other, HMA has several other state opioid response grants, SOR2 grants, that we'll be engaging in. None of them focused explicitly on the pregnant population, but obviously when you're talking about um, substance use disorder writ large, you're gonna have some of the population be pregnant. So I, I imagine there will be opportunities for some continued TA and certainly sharing subject matter expertise around that. Um, I think I'm not, you guys had such a wonderful case I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about Caleb, but I will tell you that in, in all of our work, we, we love working on case studies and we have several, we kind of call them archetypes because they're, they're, uh, they're real people, but they're often a uh, collapsed case into one. And we use Kayla as one of those. So, you know, imagining this young woman who uh, had some challenges in her in her young life, some aces to be sure, got addicted to oxycodone and hydrocodone after a motor vehicle accident and has had a tough time, lost one baby to Child Protective Services or had one baby taken away from Child Protective Services um, and, uh, and has had now come into the emergency room with an overdose. So I want to take a little bit of time. We'll kind of hit on some of your questions about Matt and Bupe and, and so forth. I, I put this slide together some months ago when I was talking to people in the law enforcement world, corrections and probations and judges and, and folks like that, um, trying to come up with a simplistic way to explain to them which medication assisted treatments or other interventions work, which don't work, and what are some of the outcomes. And so the outcomes are kind of the column headings, overdose deaths, retention and treatment, pregnancy outcomes like preterm labor, um, or uh, I'm sorry, not preterm labor, preterm births, um, or fetal demise and NAS is neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, the row headings are the different interventions. So detox or withdrawal, methadone, um, monobuprenorphine, uh, the combination products, and then naltrexone. So what stands out to you, or what ought to stand out to you, first and foremost, is that big red line across the row uh, headed by detoxification and withdrawal. What we know now from the literature very clearly, and um, all of the major professional organizations that care for women and children have now come out with statements and policies about this, is that detox, just detox or withdrawal, is not an effective treatment for a pregnant woman who has opioid use disorder. Yes, we've all heard of one-off stories where you know, the phenomenal physician has had a phenomenal relationship with his pregnant patient and gotten her detox and off of opioid use disorder. But what we know from the literature is that the relapse rate with detox withdrawal is 85%. 85%. And so um, what that means, the flip side of that is MAT 
and you know we're getting more data about that but but matt in general has about a 55 to 65 percent success rate in keeping women into treatment keeping women into treatment for at least a year and let me tell you as a physician there are few things i can write a prescription for or give a patient for any kind of chronic disorder that are that effective you know if i'm giving a statin drug to somebody and i want to prevent heart disease i got to give that to 2000 patients before i present a single heart attack with matt it turns things around phenomenally um, uh, I'll go through the rest of it very quickly. So you'll see kind of these shadings of darker green and lighter green. The reason for that is, if you think about it, methadone's been around for a heck of a long time, right? Methadone has been around since the 1940s. It was licensed in 72 by the FDA for treatment of, of heroin addiction or opioid use disorder. Um, and so we've got a lot more evidence in the professional literature and the peer-reviewed literature. There are, you know, 2,000 plus peer-reviewed articles. BUP is relatively recent. It was only licensed in, sorry, in uh, 2008 for use in the treatment of, of opioid use disorder. And so there's only a couple of hundred uh, peer-reviewed journal articles at this point around uh, perinatal substance use, about around opioid use disorder. So that's why it's a little bit lighter green. But increasingly, as you all know, um, the experience is that more and more folks like myself who treat individuals who have substance use disorder, opioid use disorders, um, are more and more comfortable and getting better outcomes with folks on bup than on methadone uh, but they are but they are both very effective methadone is still technically speaking the gold standard just because of that longer history but the story is untold and will continue to unfold and we'll learn more about that so the question about um the mono buprenorphine product or the combination buprenorphine product and you'll pardon me if i don't use the brand names but you know when we give these lectures we have to be careful not to use brand names, even though that's what you all know, what your patients know, right? Um, uh, again, uh, the literature right now is in favor of using the mono product, just buprenorphine. However, um, there are increasing case studies and the literature is growing beyond case studies that using the combination product of buprenorphine and naloxone, naloxone is also safe during pregnancy. And when you think about it, that ought to make sense um, because as, as you probably know, the reason why um, naloxone was combined with buprenorphine was to decrease the diversion uh, of that combination product. However, if you're taking the film or the sublingual uh, of the combination product, when that naloxone is taken by mouth, either absorbed or e even swallowed, the drug naloxone is just not available. It's not metabolized in a way that makes it available in the body. So there's no effect of the naloxone, right? So um, I expect that over time, we'll be seeing more and more use of the, of the combination product with pregnant women. women. Is, are there other questions about that? Does that kind of answer one of the questions that had come up? And you know, feel free to throw something in the chat. Um, just a comment about naltrexone. So again, a, you know, less, less of an evidence base of naltrexone just because we've had less experience in pregnancy. As you both know, now, not both, as you know, naltrexone is an antagonist while methadone and buprenorphine are both agonists. So what that means is the, the methadone and the buprenorphine stimulate those opioid receptors and they they you know they 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 push heroin or other opioids off 
but they produce, they stimulate the production of dopamine, uh, assuming that that individual continues to have dopamine production naturally. The naltrexone blocks the production, uh, <clears throat> blocks the production of dopamine. And dopamine, I imagine I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here. So dopamine is absolutely critical for motivation, for emotion, for decision making, for you know being okay getting up out of bed in the morning. Um, and so when individuals have opioid use disorder for a long period of time, they go through this process of dopamine depletion for a variety of reasons of how the body kind of reacts to that over time. And we can talk about that in detail if you, if you want to go there. Um, but that dopamine depletion state is very debilitating. It's very depressing. And that's what leads to all the cravings, right? Because when you have opioid use disorder, you're seeking drug not so much for a high anymore, but you just want to get back to a baseline with your dopamine level so that you can be functional. That's what craving is all about. And now Trexone doesn't really do anything to address the dopamine depletion problem that individuals with opioid use disorder have. So um, it's, a, it's a great drug for individuals who are highly motivated. Maybe they haven't had a uh, a long-standing opioid use addiction, or they continue to be highly functional, because that what that means for us from a medical clinical standpoint is they're still producing dopamine. They're they're not in that dopamine depletion state. Um, can naloxone cause nausea? Uh, sure, um, it's not overwhelming. And when it's again when it's taken in that um, film, we're not getting that nausea effect because it's not really. Uh, bioactive in the it's not having its activity in the bottle uh, in the body um, okay moving along um, here's another chatterfall for you we won't go through the directions again because you know how to do this um, this is your question type in the chatter box chat box and then wait and we'll tell you to send what kind of patient facing materials do you think would be most helpful for you and your clients We'll take a few, maybe half a minute or less to type in your responses and hold off until I tell you to send them. And I did see the question, your well, question, Alex, about yeah. uh, meth and, and poly, poly, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and push send. Okay, we want to see literature that advises patients, non-stigma language that's welcoming, um, how, the, how MAT affects babies, about NAS, more info about NAS. Rack cards, I'm not 100% sure what that is. So, you so a rack, so, so in other words. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, patient yeah. education rack. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Personal stories, yeah, lived experience. Uh, can I, can I comment, Helen, on one please, of these? Please, please. I, I just want to, I want to recognize Jill for using the word welcoming. Yes. I was a triage nurse at a local hospital for years. And, um, you know, anybody that comes into a hospital, even if it's for a wonderful reason like birth, it's still such a, an anxiety provoking situation, right? And that first experience, front desk, whether it's in a, a clinic, an office, a triage or an ER, that first experience should be welcoming. And it doesn't often happen in healthcare. And that's something that, um, that means something to me because when you come into healthcare, your healthcare clinicians, your providers, the folks that care for you, front desk staff should be welcoming. And that we're glad you're here and we want to take care of you and thank you for coming. And I, I was, you know, I tried at our facility to actually get that language um, into to use just to say, welcome, we're going to take care of you, you know, and that should be your first emphasis, not everything. Else. Yeah, I think that's thank right. You. And, and it gets to, you know, this is, um, this is, I think, one of Christina and my favorite 
statements. And Christina, you may want to make a comment. And then I want to talk a little bit about stigma, because that was one of the other issues that came up. And I want to. Um, no, this is it just says it all right. I mean, yeah. because you're it's really the future you want to you're caring for the future. And we yeah. got, you know, we've got to get folks in. Yeah, yeah, and we won't we won't forget the the Matt announcements for sure. Radio um, ads, that's interesting, Helen. I you know the DHCS ads that ran, um, and I'm a I'm a sports fan, so I listen to to KMBR in the Bay Area, especially during my drive in the morning, and um, they were great commercials. However, none of them did address pregnancy and say you know if you're pregnant, we want to get you into care. You're right, very general. Uh, general use. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I think that's, that's really useful. Um, I think that the issue about stigma that was, that came up earlier, how do you prepare women for stigma? What, what do you deal with the stigma? And, and I, I would say, you know, one of the other things that we promote very heavily is the importance of trying to get all staff comfortable with and trained in and practiced in because it's not enough just to train but to actually get them practice in trauma-informed care practices and using motivational interviewing techniques because um, that's the way to really begin a dialogue and try to establish some trust as opposed to stigma that if you think about it, um, and I, I just, I, if you guys don't get our, our perinatal newsletter, I, I would encourage you or we can send it to, to Christian or Elizabeth and they can send it out to you. Um, I don't know if you've seen it yet, Christina. We, we did a little kind of a redux on stigma. Our very first newsletter was about stigma and we just did another one and it's really, we we're talking about the relationship between stigma and racism, frankly, um, and, and out and out oppression. Because when you, when you, you know, all of us, we meet new people. So people have a lot of similarities and people have a lot of differences. And one of the things that we do naturally as human beings is we tend to categorize people. That's what kind of helps. You know, that's what we do to kind of make sense of a, of a chaotic world and a, and a lot of different inputs. However, you know, when we generalize and we categorize people, that leads to labeling and stereotyping. And then when we insert our judgment there, oh, this is just drug seeking behavior, or oh, I'm gonna walk on the other side of the street, et cetera. Um, then we get into that attitudinal realm of prejudice. And then when we take action on that, um, we cross the, to the other side of the street or we you know, slam the lockdown in our cars or we lock our cars. Um, that becomes, this, or, or we, we just don't do a good job with an intake. And you know, believe me, so I'm a provider, you guys work with providers. I think I can safely say my people in the healthcare world, my provider people are some of the worst actors when it comes to using stigmatizing judgmental language uh, related to individuals who have substance use disorder. So we absolutely have to get to that. We do have some materials in our toolkit um, and in patient-facing materials, and there are a number of really great webinar recordings on our website about stigma and about uh, motivational interviewing that um, I think are helpful for staff. For the clients, I think what you need to do is mostly talk to them about that and prepare them for that and help them to understand, nice. you know, the, the reality is every single one of us has some kind of experience in our personal lives with addiction one way or another. And generally speaking, we tend to have very confused, angry, complex emotions related to that experience often. 
And so I think what our clients need to understand is that even though those st that stigmatizing language and behavior is absolutely directed at them, it's really a manifestation of that individual's, the person who's using that stigmatizing language and behavior, it's a manifestation of their own challenges and struggles in working through their emotions about things they just don't understand. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that may be only mildly reassuring, but um, I think it's important for, for our clients to understand they're going to, they're going to experience the stigma, but we've got to, um, we've got to at least prepare them for that. Helen, I'd love to talk more, but you know what, we're at a 15 minute mark. I know. Can we so, have, can we have uh, five more minutes and then we'll give you your announcement? Um, I would love to do it now and then we can get oh, back to the Q&A if that's okay. Just because yeah, the yeah, sounds are perfect. Really, so, this a yeah. But we normally are able to, um, you know, keep this open a few minutes extra if people cool. have. Uh, okay, cool. Christian, do we have you back? I know he had to. No? Okay. Um, so these are, so Melissa, I'm going to have yes. to or Vanessa go ahead and take over our data updates now. This is something the sons um, are really eager to hear. So go for it, Melissa. Yes, I, so I have a quick data update on what's expected from everyone at the end of the month. And I just want to let you all know that we will be continuing to collect data each month from you all, along with all of the other sites who will be receiving the HPP funding. And just as always, July data will be due on August 10th. And everything is uh, going to stay pretty much the same. It'll still be the same link on our website, the same data portal where you're going to enter the information. The only difference you'll see is that when you log in, we're only going to ask you these four questions on the uh, screen right now. So I know we said we're going to simplify it. Here are some specific details on how we made it a little bit more simple. So we'll just collect um, total patients served, meaning any patient you see for any reason each month, along with the patients with OUD who you're seeing and those that are getting uh, buprenorphine either in your hospital or getting a prescription. So this should be pretty easy. This is all stuff you've already been reporting. Um, same place and that will be updated on our website at the end of the month. So uh, on the 31st next Friday, you'll see that it's gonna get a facelift. If you have any questions, obviously always reach out to us. Um, we're all here and before I get off and give it back, I just wanna say thanks to everyone for all your hard work in helping us get caught up with data from the past couple of months. Uh, I know that was a little bit of effort to make sure you had everything in, so we really appreciate that. Thanks. And I have two additional announcements that I don't think we have a slide for. I apologize for that. So the, ne the next two announcements I wanna share is that we will be continuing to hold trainings during this time slot in August. The August 6th training will be another deep dive into a topic that we have um, gotten a lot of questions about so look for that to be announced soon and then listen up this is really exciting the second time slot that we have you holding in august august 20th is going to be a formal celebration of everything we've accomplished over this grant period so we encourage um we will be inviting all of your hospital champions to that event as well and we encourage you to join that event um, and also invite anybody at your hospital who might be involved with increasing your implementation C-suite members, inpatient champions, members of your case management or social work team. The site celebration is called Because of You, and we'll be sending an invite out for that in probably the next two business days. We have a nice graphic you can forward along to others in your hospital who might be interested. And finally, oh, it's also on the chat. Um, the formal invitation is on yep. the chat. We just got that ready to go. Um, and then the final thing we want to announce is that we have a job opening on the California Bridge Program team that Serena wants to tell you about. Serena, are you with us? Maybe? No, okay. Yeah, Serena? Serena was having internet issues, so she texted me that she might not actually be. Um, okay, there you are. Okay. 
Hi. Can you hear me? And yep. you can see you. me. Awesome. Okay. So we're having a few changes at California Bridge in terms of the way that the sun work is staffed. And so as part of that, because there's going to be this big expansion from 50 suns to hopefully more than 200 across the state, we actually are opening up a new position. It is the sun program director position. And I think someone just chatted out the job posting. So I just wanted to call this to all of your attention. If you might be interested or somebody that you know, please take a look, forward it on. This is a senior level position. So we are looking for someone who has at least three years of management experience. That's probably, and obviously who has a background in this type of work. We're not thinking we will necessarily be lucky enough to have someone who has actually been a son, but if we did, that would be amazing. So definitely want to encourage you all to take a look, see if you're interested, and please spread the word. Thanks. Very cool. So Sounds you'll be receiving a follow-up email with um, the job posting, the celebration invitation, and uh, all of these amazing resources that Christina and Helen will now um, go back to. So thanks yeah. for the time. Perfect. Thank you for that. Christina, do you want to run through some of these resources? We, yeah, by so, the way, we'll send you a PDF with these slides, and so you'll have all these resources listed. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, I'm actually good, Helen. The SAMHSA National Helpline, I, I love that. Um, that The hotline? It, yeah, that yeah. one in particular. It's a great page. There's a ton of information just on that one page. So we'd yeah. love to take, obviously, we'd love you to take a look at the best practices in our toolkit. Uh, there's a lot of them. <laughs> there are 39 of them. So there's a lot of info. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. If you want to focus on that, uh, you know, a couple, um, obviously the screening is huge. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I don't know if this is going to blow your mind or not, but uh, we don't screen every pregnant woman in the state of California. We're not doing it. We have a lot of room for improvement. Yep. And that is, that's been one of our focuses for the collaborative, because that's very upsetting, obviously. And there's so much stigma and uh, even prejudice in, uh, in screening, uh, whether a person gets screened or not. Uh, there are marked improvements, actually, and we're just finishing our survey with the hospitals uh, on their screening effort, efforts during the collaborative, but we have a way to go in the state of California, unfortunately. And I will say, even though the name of the toolkit is nastoolkit.org, um, it's named that because that was the URL that, were avail that was available. The best practices there run the gamut from um, outpatient-related activities to inpatient-related activities to very women-focused activities to some generic best practices. So. Uh, I would encourage you to, in your spare time, take a look at that. Um, nearly every single one of those best practices has both resources as well as references attached to them. The resources are all hyperlinks to, you know, an actual protocol or additional toolkit or document, et cetera. And those can be very, very, very helpful. Uh, I mentioned earlier, too, some of the recorded webinars. So we have uh, the addictionfreeca.org website has a ton of materials of all sorts. The patient-facing materials we mentioned are on that website under the Mother and Baby Substance Exposure Initiative, as are a variety of different webinars and others, and a variety of other things that you all already know about, including, oh, look at that, Bridge to Treatment is in there, too. Helen? Yeah. Can we can we ask Eric to share his story? Yes. If Eric, are you prepared to do that? Would you like? We'd love to hear it if you'd like to share that. Eric, can you get yourself off mute, or can we unmute him? I wonder if he stepped away. Oh, maybe so. Um, and he was talking, I think he mentioned something about CPS. We, we had a couple of additional thoughts. So we got a few more questions, uh, a, a few more minutes. Um, we, we stuck a couple of other slides in here about different issues that we thought you might ask about. So breastfeeding and medication assisted treatment, yes, absolutely encourage it. A little bit gets through to the breast milk. 
um, uh, ho however, the positive effects, both the physical as well as the psychosocial effects of the mom and baby bonding, um, and the long-term effects for both baby and mom far outweigh any minor concerns that one might have related to medication-assisted treatment. This presumes, obviously, that mom doesn't have any other medical contraindications, like she's not HIV positive, and that she's stable on treatment, so that she, you know she's not sort of back and forth using and, and using her uh, medication-assisted treatment. Um, I'm seeing, oh, that's a, a question. Oh, there's Eric, I think Eric's good. Oh, there he is, go Eric. Oh, I, I, let me hang up my phone because I'm hearing like 16 versions of what's happening right now. I'll have to listen to it too. Hold on. Okay, can you hear me still? We yeah. sure can. Um, how's this? Yeah, yes, that's great. I'm still, I'm still not hearing you guys though. Well, keep talking, Eric. Well, Anyway, I don't need to hear you tell my story, but I'll go with it, okay? Um, <laughs> so this is a, it's a similar situation um, from the one described in a case study. Um, we had a patient come in to the emergency department. I think she was like 20, 29 weeks pregnant. Um, her demographic information is 22 years old, uh, identifies as female, identifies as... Uh, it's Hispanic or Latino. Oh, is it difficult? Is this better? Perfect. Better, yeah. Okay. So she, she identifies as a Hispanic, Hispanic Latino um, and female, and she does reside in like Placer County or something like that, which is really inconsequential to the story, but I like to help people with demographics so they can kind of build a picture, right? So um, this person came in and she was seeking treatment um, she's used, used, uh, she's an injection drug user. She was seeking treatment for, for drug use because she was going into treatment, um, inpatient treatment with her baby. And she was in severe, starting to go into severe, um, opioid withdrawal. Um, and it was a tenuous situation because the mom was the one that was like hanging out with her and bringing her to the appointment and stuff like that. And there was other mitigating factors yeah. such as that she was like HIV positive too. Right. So we have all this stress and this girl, she's 22 years old. This, this person, this young lady is 22 years old, scared out of her mind in opioid withdrawal in the emergency department. And I come to the scene and she's been there for about 45 minutes to an hour and she hasn't received medication yet. Right. So in my head, I'm going, OK, that's weird. Let me go. Take, let me go check it out. Um, and because of the HIV and because of some other stuff, they were taking a little bit more time and precaution with the prescribing to make sure that it was safe and to make sure that nothing was counterindicated and that there was nothing on board that might um, further harm or put the, the family at risk, right? So, um, and we waited and then we waited um, and then we waited and then OB came down to find the heart rate um, and we were waiting um and then labor started right um and i said i think it was 29 weeks at this point so pretty a little bit early labor right and ob said oh yeah okay so labor's starting we can't tell if this is withdrawal or if this is labor or pre-labor or whatever right um, and i said <laughs> i don't know i'm not a doctor right um but I did say, I did, I consulted with some of my, with my champions and stuff like that. And, and they said, oh yeah, you know, uh, um, opioid withdrawal can, can trigger preterm pregnancy um, and it can create all these different scenarios. So all these different scenarios started going through my head. Like this girl just used heroin recently. Um, if she has this baby right now, it's going to be born pause tox and it's going to create this whole situation. And I said, this lady needs buke right now because if she's going to have this baby, she needs to have buke right now so she can have the baby, be comfortable. Um, and safely deliver this baby. Um, if she's not going to deliver this baby right now, she needs bupe so she can safely go through the rest of her pregnancy, deliver this baby safely, and give this baby a solid chance at life. Um, so after a lot of urging and bugging and running around and saying, we need to give this person medicine, 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 eventually a nurse 
and a, and a, one of the providers did give her medicine, right? Um, so they gave her the medicine, they transferred her up to OB for monitoring, um, and they were able to keep the labor from happening, right? Which, I mean, is a monumental thing for this family. I mean, there was really two roads that we could have gone down in this situation, and I feel like we went down the better, you know, thank gosh. Um, and then I followed up with her. We were able to work with this patient until labor happened. She never did end up going to treatment, but I was able to follow up with her enough and follow up with her frequently enough to bring her into visits and to bring her back into OB, like you're talking about, to get her to her appointments, to deliver safely, and to, and to give this baby a really good, solid chance at a good life, right? She's still having issues, and, and you know, she is still, I'm still corresponding with her and family, but baby's happy, baby's healthy, baby's the grandma, and mom's still figuring her stuff out. So, I mean, we're going to be here for her when she's ready, right? That's my story. All right. That's fantastic. That's great to hear. And, and I really want to commend you for, um, you know, you folks could get intimidated, uh, especially when specialists, you know, whoo, come down. And <laughs> uh, I am impressed. I am definitely impressed with you and, uh, and uh, for sticking to it and, and speaking up from experience and from what you're, what you're seeing. Um, and uh, so kudos to you for, uh, for really advocating on behalf of that patient. Yeah. Absolutely. Great, and I was um, I was trying to sort of um, listen to Eric and type some other responses to questions we can get to. Um, I wish we could talk a lot more about Child Protective Services. There is much to be said there. I know we're over time. I will tell you though that um, we have a program called Touch Points where we've been going up and down the state training. Um, probations and child protective services workers and, and drug court and dependency court workers, um, mostly at the supervisory level. I say workers, but it's really been mostly at the supervisory level so that they know more about the chronic nature, the chronic disease nature of substance use disorder and more about MAT and can be more open and accepting about MAT when they make their screwy orders that judges often do. Um, we, those training modules are now available at addictionfreeca.org for line staff, and we're, we're hoping to sort of get more line staff on board as well, because that's really critical. And I will finally say, um, we're working with the State Department of Social Services, that's the agency that oversees Child Protective Services at the county levels uh, across the state. And um, we, we have provided some feedback to them on their next all county letter about how they approach substance use disorder. So, you know, we're trying to use every avenue we can to bring people on board, but the, the best way to do that is make relationships, keep communicating, and um, make sure that more and more folks understand um, what the, what the journey is like, that the disorder is a disease, it's not a choice, um, and the behaviors that we see are symptoms of the disease, not willful behaviors directed at a provider, um, and that there's treatment for it, and that you all are the best advocates and partners to walk with our clients through this pathway and this journey. It's been a delight to be yeah. with you. I've really appreciated how active you guys are on the chat. That's been wonderful. Um, love to come back and talk with you more. Is the zip code 96140? I, I have. <laughs> All right. I hope everybody will stay safe and well and continue to advocate and be active and do good things. Bye bye, everyone. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.